Real people. Real radio. Wherever you are, make it TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. You're listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. With your host, Rob Skiba. All I'm offering is the truth. Hello and welcome to the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. And tonight, I'm excited to host, for the first time, and maybe the first time of many, a debate. And we're calling it the Battle of the Seed Line Debate. It will deal with the Serpent Seed Doctrine. Is it true or not? My guests for this debate are Zen Garcia, arguing in favor of it and Minister Dante Fortson arguing against it. As you may remember, Zen was on the Revolutionary Radio Project last week. In addition to also being a radio talk show host here on TFR, he is the author of 12 books, with four being specifically related to this topic. Lucifer, father of Cain, the Aramaic and Palestinian Targums, the Great Contest War in Heaven, and the Great Contest II, enmity between the seed lines. He is also the lead publisher and editor of Sacred Word Publishing LLC, sacredwordpublishing.net, and the director of the nonprofit Endeavor Freedom, Inc. He'll be debating Minister Dante Fortson, who has been a guest on the Revolutionary Radio Project several times before when I was uh, back on the uh, blog talk radio days back in those days. Uh, but I don't think he's been with us here on the Truth Frequency Radio Network before, so I'm excited to have him with us here this evening. Dante Fortson is the author of As the Days of Noah Were, Beyond Flesh and Blood, The Ultimate Guide to Angels and Demons, and The Serpent Seed Debunked. He currently writes for ministerfortson.com and blackhistoryinthebible.com. His latest ongoing project is the Awakening Study Bible, a community-created online study Bible that incorporates audio, video, images, notes, and social media into scripture. Going to have to have him on the show to talk about that sometime. Dante's book dealing with this evening's topic, of course, is called The Serpent Seed Debunked. It's available on Amazon.com or through his website, ministerfortson.com. Now, before we begin, let me just say that although at times I've had passionate disagreements with both of these gentlemen on social media before, I've always had nothing but tremendous respect for both of them, and I consider them both to be friends and brothers in Christ. Why do I say that? Well, because the areas of disagreement that we've had are known as what we would call non-essential issues, meaning they have no bearing on our eternal destination, our salvation. When it comes to the core essential, i.e. that Yeshua, or Jesus Christ, if you prefer, is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes into the Father except through him, all three of us are in agreement on this, and we believe that it is a free gift by grace through faith and not of works. So this makes us brothers. Um, When it comes to the issue of tonight's debate, up to this point, I've been 100% in agreement with Dante's position. That's until last week. (laughs) Um, I got to be honest and say that Zen's given me much to think about after that program. And uh, after doing a fair amount of my own research over this past week, I'm a lot less confident than I was before. So I think in this regard that I'm probably in a pretty good position to really be kind of a impartial moderator for this debate. And uh, I guess, therefore, my challenge will be for Dante to either convince me to return to my previously strong-held position (laughs) or for Zen to push me over the edge to his side of the debate. Um, And perhaps you guys listening may be in the same boat. Now, uh, we'll be taking a look at a number of scriptures this evening, and we'll also examine some extra-biblical historical texts, including Targums and commentaries as well, I'm sure. Here's the way the debate's going to go. 
since we heard a lot from Zen last week, I'll give Dante the starting round. He will give us his opening statements for 10 minutes. Then we'll yield the floor for 10 minutes for Zen to give his opening statements. And one, one person to speak, I'm going to ask both of the participants to mute their mic so that uh, the other person can speak without any interruptions. And um, when once both are done with their opening statements, we'll go to break. And then in the second segment of the show, I'll give Dante 12 minutes for a rebuttal to Zen's arguments. And then 12 minutes will go to Zen to do the same against Dante's arguments. Now, you guys, the audience, will participate in the third segment. You'll need to go to the Revolutionary Radio Project Facebook group and post any questions you might have there. So if you just go to Facebook and type in in the little search window there, the Revolutionary Radio Project, uh, I think it's like the first, if not the only result that will show up uh, with your query. So um, you can go there. You'll see where everybody's posting their questions. And I'm sure we're not going to be able to read or get to all of them. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and I'll have each of the participants take about three minutes to answer the questions as best they can. And then in the final segment of this broadcast, Dante will get 12 minutes for his closing statements, and Zen will likewise get 12 minutes for his closing statements, and then I'll wrap it all up. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, let's get started, and um, let me see here. Let me get my my little, uh, I got a stopwatch ready here. So uh, we'll make sure everybody gets the exact amount of time here. So uh, Dante, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. I've got my starter ready. So you may begin now. All right, before uh, I get started, if anybody wants to follow along with the notes, I actually just posted them on ministerfortson.com. If you go there, uh, you can see the notes, my bullet points that I'm gonna make if you need to follow along with the Bible verses, you can just kind of mouse over and they'll pop up if you're on a uh, laptop. If not, you can click it and go there if you're on a tablet or a cell phone. All right. So I want to open up with this scripture that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning and craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. That's Ephesians 4.14. And I always try to keep this in mind whenever I approach any new doctrine that I did not find within the pages of the Bible. Now, in my opinion, the Bible anticipates every argument against it and goes out of its way to make a case against any false doctrines before they develop. And it's only when we step outside of the truth of the Bible that confusion creeps into the scripture. And to point to this, it says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So there are only two questions that you really need to ask yourself about all of the information that's going to be presented tonight. Does this information cause confusion to the word of God, or does this information add clarity to the word of God? And in my opinion, serpent seed belief only causes confusion to a text that's already clear and consistent concerning the events in the garden. So let's let's just start off with the Targums in general. The Targums are a translation of scripture. However, some Targums, such as the Targum of Pseudo-Jonathan or the Jerusalem Targum, they also insert commentary, which is not scripture. Now, in order to understand what commentary is, you have to understand that commentary is an opinion. It's not scripture itself. So to put commentary on the same level as actual scripture, to me, is not scriptural. I believe the Bible should come first, and that should be the basis of where we start. And then we should use other sources to confirm what we believe in, not to change what we believe in. So let's start off with the garden. It's my position that the Garden of Eden story is exactly as presented in Scripture. So if we start in Genesis 2, we see that God planted a garden east and eastward. E eastward in Eden, I'm sorry. Genesis 2, 8. Now, this is a literal garden so far. God planted this garden. When you get to Genesis 2, 9, it says all the trees, including the tree of life, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil were good for food. Now, the Bible stresses this point over and over again throughout Genesis chapter 2 
in Genesis chapter 3, which is basically what we're going to be covering for the serpent seed. Genesis 2, 9 says these trees were good for food. Now, if you want to go further into that, we can get into Ezekiel 31, verse uh, 18. I'm sorry, verse 8. It says that there were cedar trees in the garden. It says there were fir trees in the garden. There were chestnut trees in the garden. So these are literal trees. These aren't people or beings or anything like that. Uh, if you go through and read the entire verse about what happened with the trees, they were planted. They grew up out of the ground. They are named. They are good for food. Now, comparing in Ezekiel 31, it compares the glory of a kingdom to the trees in Eden, which is often taken out of context to say, well, these trees were actual beings and not actual trees. But that's consistent with the Bible. Solomon's clothes are compared to lilies of the field in Luke 12, 27. Strongholds are compared to fig trees in Nahum 3, 12. So this is consistent with scripture to make comparisons of kings and kingdoms to nature. Now, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which is really what's in question when it comes to serpent seed. Was it a literal tree or was there something sexual going on between Satan and Eve? Well, if we look at the words that are used in the text in Genesis 3, 5, Satan told Eve that if she ate the fruit, her eyes would be open and she would know good and evil. This is important because I want to stress that Satan told her if she ate the fruit. Now, in Genesis 3, 7, they eat the fruit. Their eyes are open. They learn that they are naked. So that's knowledge that they gain from eating the fruit. They learn how to sow. There's no evidence that they knew how to sow before that. It's a possibility. But this is something that seems to be new knowledge from eating the fruit. Now, if this fruit was sex, why would it teach them how to sow? They learned how to hide. There's no indication that they hid from God or anyone else before that. And that's in Genesis 3, 8. They learned fear. That was in Genesis 3, 10. And then also Adam learns how to till the ground in Genesis 3, 23. So there's a possibility that Adam knew how to till the ground because the Bible says that he was there was no man to till the ground. And then God put Adam in Eden. So these are things that they learned after eating the fruit. There's no indication of sex so far. And that, that's just a list of seven things they learn. The tree of life is pretty, pretty much straightforward. God says that if they eat from it, they'll live. That's found in Genesis 3.22. So when we get down to the event in the garden, the supposed sex with Satan, there are several things that indicate that this is not what happened. Now, Satan, the first thing he did was question Eve. Yea, did God say? Now, Eve responds and says, God said that we may eat. And again, I stress that point, eat from every tree of the garden, except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's a paraphrase of Genesis three uh, verses two through three. Satan then tells Eve that she will not die if she eats the fruit. That's in Genesis chapter three, verses four through five. Eve saw that the tree was pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. So, again, that's consistent with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And that's found in verse five in Genesis three. Now. Eve sees that the tree is good for food. This is right in line with what it says in Genesis two to nine. The trees were made for food. There is no indication of sex at all so far. Now, both Adam and Eve eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So, again, I stress this eating point because the eating is the key here over and over again. The Bible says that tree was for food and over and over again. It says they ate of this. Now, if you look at Adam and Eve's punishment, it's directly related to the fruit. Eve's punishment was pain and bearing the fruit of the womb, which are children. We find that in Genesis uh, 3, 16, and we find that in Genesis 30, verse 2, Psalms 127, 3, Isaiah 13, 8, Deuteronomy 7, 13, Hosea 9, 16, Luke 1, 42. This fruit of the womb is always mentioned as children. The fruit is not the man's seed or the serpent's seed. It is either a child or literal fruit. 
there's an inconsistency as well when you get into the serpent seed. The serpent is not the tree. The tree is not the serpent. Eve ate the fruit of the tree. Eve did not eat the fruit of the serpent. The serpent did not give Eve the fruit. The Bible says that Eve took the fruit herself. So you have these consistent metaphors in the Bible for sex, and none of them appear in any of the so-called serpent seed text in Genesis chapters 2 through 3. Yo, now, the Bible, okay, the Bible says when people have sex, they either knew the person or came in unto the person or went in unto the person. We see this used all throughout the Bible. We see the seed is in the man, Genesis 4.25, Genesis 9.9, Genesis 15.8. But never once is this terminology used in Genesis 2 and 3. The only way to conclude that any of this was sexual is to completely disregard the rest of the metaphors used in the Bible, where the seed is the man, the woman represents fertile ground, the child grows up in the and becomes the fruit of the womb. So if we take the consistent mentions or references to sex in the Bible, if we apply it to serpent seed, the fruit would have to represent a child and not semen or sex. So in consistency, Satan would have had to offer Eve a child to eat if you want to stay consistent with the rest of Scripture, which is my main problem with serpent seed. It does not maintain a scriptural consistency. All right, perfect. That's 10 minutes. Thank you, Dante. And we'll ask if Dante could mute his microphone. And Zen, you have 10 minutes beginning now. All right. Well, beginning, if you look in chapter 2, it says that they were naked and unashamed in Genesis chapter 2. And then you get to Genesis chapter 3, which, as I explained in the show before, I do agree with Dante, that the tree was a literal tree and that when she ate of the fruit that the reason the most high told her that she was going to die and Adam was going to die is because when they touched it it turned them into mortal human physicality and they lost their bright natures their light vesture and when that happened that's when she was seduced by the serpent which in if you go to second uh, Corinthians chapter 11 Verse 2 and 3, you see that Paul also references in this passage that it was her being beguiled by the serpent that led to her not being a chaste virgin. And that her becoming beguiled, when you look up that word beguiled, it's expatio. It means wholly seduced. When you go to the same thing in Genesis chapter 3, the Hebrew word is nasha which also means greatly or utterly morally seduced. And so when she was seduced, that's what led to the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And the Most High is talking to the serpent and says, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Now, how does the serpent get seed if there's no sexual connotation to the serpent beguiling Eve and impregnating with her, her with Cain. If the fruit is a literal apple or a pomegranate or some other fruit from a literal tree, how does it result in children? And also the punishments that are laid out in Genesis 315, 316, and 317, specifically that Eve would be cursed in childbirth and you have to go through conception in bringing forth children. How does an apple result in her conceiving children? When you look up the Hebrew words for what is being uh, specified within the terms eat, it says to lie with a woman. When you says touch, that also is seduced in moral uh, to enjoy sexual pleasure. Um, and the the word for fruit and also seed, they completely uh, are linked to children, progeny, descendants, and even mention semen and the virility of men. Uh, so how do you not see the connections to the sexual connotations associated 
with the Hebrew definitions for all of those words and what occurred in the garden. And I'll read the passage from 2 Corinthians. It says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And so Paul is referencing here that it was because Eve was beguiled by the serpent, again, wholly seduced, you can look up the word yourself, and that is what resulted in her losing her virginity. How in any way does an apple cause a woman to lose her virginity and then also result in her conceiving children if it has no sexual connotation? Uh, it's only by uh, being corrupted sexually that a woman can then have children and bring forth progeny. And that's why it's in the curses levity in, in Genesis chapter 3, the punishments levied against them, that the Most High saw that she was already uh, pregnant, which is why after they ate the fruit, they covered their genitalia. If they were simply eating something from their mouths, why wouldn't they just cover their mouths? Why cover their genitalia? There's something associated to the fruit and to the genitals that occurred, which is why they were shameful and that they hid themselves away from the Most High God. They were shameful because of the act that they had occurred, and the reason they covered their genitals is because that is what they used in the act which brought them shame. That's why they hid from the Most High God. And when he tells them, who told you you were naked, and then tells them that I'm going to put uh, enmity between thy seed and her seed, speaking to the serpent, and that Eve, you're going to now bring forth children in sorrow, uh, in sorrowful conception, and Adam, you're going to have to now work the ground uh, to bring forth sustenance to feed your progeny that you're about to have? I mean, I don't see how somebody even reading these passages cannot make these connections. And then when you go to Matthew chapter 13, where Christ explains the parable of the kingdom, the tares of the field, and also the sower, he tells you that an enemy snuck into the garden while men slept, and that the enemy, the wicked one, the devil, is responsible for sowing the tares. And then he tells you uh, to allow, that he tells the angels, allow both to grow together until the time of the end, and I will send my angels forth as reapers to then um, separate the tares for burning and the wheat for preservation. And just to clarify, it, once the apostles come up to him and ask him to explain the parable of the tares of the field, not speaking in parable any longer, he tells them precisely that the enemy which sowed the tares it the, is the wicked one, which is connecting to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12, where it says, Cain, who is of the wicked one. That word thereof means child of, when you look it up in the Hebrew. And so it means that Cain, who was the child of the wicked one, which is exactly what Christ is referencing here in Matthew. And then to clarify who the wicked one is, he said that the wicked one, the enemy, is the devil, and that the devil is the father of this of the tares. And then he reiterates two more times um, with the parable of the tares of the field, and also with the the parable of sending, casting forth the net, and bringing forth the harvest. And he says the harvest is at the end of the days when the tares are gathered for burning and the wheat for preservation. So John, Paul, and Christ in the scriptures, in the King James Version that everybody studies, are telling you that what occurred in the garden with Eve's beguilement is her, in fact, being seduced by the serpent 
impregnated with Cain, and that Cain was a son of the devil. He was the patriarch of the tares. He, and he was the firstborn son of the devil, which is why Christ, when he references the Pharisees, he says, I know you are Abraham's seed, but ye are of your father the devil, because they were the ones that usurped uh, in Joshua, the ones that lied when Joshua went into Canaan, and they said they were from a, a faraway place. And then they were made to be servants unto the scribes, which is exactly what Noah said of the Canaanites, those children born of Ham, which are the serpent seed continued through the flood, which we'll go into that later this evening as well. And you got one minute. That. <clears throat> and so anybody that studies the scripture, and again, we'll go into the Targums and the ancient commentaries as well, because they will confirm that this is the teaching that is elaborated upon by Paul, John, and Christ. And there, it's not necessary to go outside of the King James, out of the canon. But when you do, it becomes clarified by all the extra-biblical accounts and also by the ancient scriptures, which the Hebrews study from themselves. The Aramaic Targum are the first translations of the Hebrew Torah. And... The King James is a Targum. The Greek Septuagint is a Targum. It just means translation. There are Targums being created even in this day and age for those people that are translating the scriptures into their own language. This has had occurred over and over again all through time. But the original Aramaic Targum were based on the exact Hebrew Torah and the precision of the scribes and translating it to, to Greek was similar to what they did with the Aramaic. Why All right, they- and that's time. Right. And um, good opening statements from both of you. When we come back from the break, I'll give Dante the floor. He'll have 12 minutes for a rebuttal, and then Zen will get 12 minutes after that. See you after the break. back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba. For the second segment of the broadcast, we're having a debate. It's called the Battle of the Seed Lines Debate with Zen Garcia and Dante Fortson. And in the first segment, each were given 10 minutes to give their opening statements. So now on this segment, we will start with Dante. He will have 12 minutes to give a rebuttal to what he heard Zen say. And then after that, Zen will get 12 minutes as a rebuttal to what he heard Dante say. And um, in the third segment, you guys, uh, the audience listening, you will be able to participate. If you go to Facebook and search for the Revolutionary Radio Project Facebook group, uh, you can ask your questions there, and we will do our best to answer those in the third segment. All right, so here we go. Let me get the timer ready here. And Dante, you have 12 minutes beginning now. All right, cool. All right, so first of all, I'm so glad that Zen brought up... um, Abraham and John 8, and also uh, 2 Corinthians. So Zen mentioned that in 2 Corinthians, let me, let me make sure the reference is right, 2 Corinthians, that it refers to Cain being of the wicked one. Hold on, let me make sure I got the right verse. All right, let me start at John 8. I'll come back to the Corinthians. All right, so in John 8, we have Jesus's statement, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me because my word hath no place in you. Now, according to Zen, when Jesus said, ye are of your father, the devil in verse 844, or chapter eight, verse 44, that it meant that they were the children of the devil. 
the problem here is that in John 8, 37, where Jesus says, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, the word seed there is Strong's number 4690, which is sperma. It means descendants or children. That is the word used for seed. When you get down to verse 44, Jesus uses the word ek, E-K, ek. It refers to actions or from the inside out. It does not refer to lineage. So when Zen says that Jesus is calling them the seed of the devil, that's not true. Jesus explains that. He says, your actions are of the devil. You want to kill me. He acknowledges that they are Abraham's sperma or descendants. Now, first John, I'm sorry, it wasn't Corinthians. First John 3, 12, Zen quoted this too, where it says, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. Again, you have the word ek. They do not use the word sperma here. And sperma is the word that says these are descendants. Ek does not refer to descendancy at all in any way, shape or form. So that's an inconsistency when trying to use those verses to back up the serpent seed belief because they just don't apply once you look them up. Now, anybody wants to look them up. Sperma is Strong's 4690. Ek is Strong's 1537. And you can go read those for yourself. Zen also mentioned that Eve touched the fruit which allowed her to be seduced. Well, if you go to your Bible and you read the order of events, Satan convinces her first. She takes the fruit and immediately eats. There's not a she touches the fruit and then Satan convinces her and then she eats. His events are out of order that he gave. She was seduced first and then she ate the fruit. And then there's also the assumption of virginity because in Genesis 1:22. God had already told them to be fruitful and multiply. Now, we don't know if people just got pregnant the very first time they had sex because it, it doesn't happen like that all the time. So there's no evidence that Eve was a virgin. It's only assumption. We don't know if she was or wasn't. We just know that in Genesis 1, they were given the command to be fruitful and multiply. So that's another inconsistency. Now, let's go back to the to the having your minds corrupted for Paul. He says, but I fear lest by any mean as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted, not your bodies. It wasn't a physical corruption. It was a mental corruption. And it's consistent with what happened in the garden. Satan had a conversation with Eve in which he convinced her that it was okay to take the fruit, which Eve said would make her wise. So she ate the fruit and then she gave it to Adam. But there's also another order of events that is clearly being ignored, the birth of Cain. So if we look at the actual order of events, according to scripture, Satan tells Eve that she will not die from eating this fruit. Eve then looks at the fruit, says it is good for food and to make her wise. There's no reference to sex in there at all whatsoever. She eats the fruit and then they are punished. The punishment goes right along with the situation. Adam has to now till the ground with effort. Eve has to give or birth with pain. Now, again, it goes with that saying, the fruit of the womb. So now Eve's birth is going to be painful in bearing the fruit of the womb. But let's go to Genesis 4.1. Well, actually, before Genesis 4.1, you have God's reaction. And if anybody's following along with the notes, uh, I just updated them. So if you hit refresh, there's more notes on there. So God's first question to Eve and Adam, who told thee that thou was naked? Now, this is information they got from eating the fruit. This is consistent with them getting knowledge. The next question was, hast thou eaten of the tree? 
Not did you have sex with Satan or anything like that. There's no accusation of sex. And this is in Genesis 3.11. Hast thou eaten of the tree? Now, if the tree is a literal tree and Eve ate from the tree, where do we get this whole Eve had sex with the serpent? Because there's no physical interaction with the serpent. There's no handing. There's no touching. There's no nothing. It says that Satan told her this tree was good. Eve took the fruit from the tree. Her eyes were opened and they immediately knew they were naked. As I mentioned before, they learned how to sew. They learned how to hide and a bunch of other stuff. If you go down to Genesis 322, God is concerned about them taking from the tree of life and living forever. So he sets cherubim. The I am is multiple in Hebrew, multiple cherubim with a flaming sword to guard the tree of life. Now, if you're going to have your metaphors be consistent and eating from that tree of knowledge is sex with Satan, then you also have to apply that eating from the tree of life would have to represent having sex with something. And if God wanted to stop Adam and Eve from having sex with something else, he wouldn't need multiple cherubim and a flaming sword that turned in every direction to stop them. It just wouldn't be necessary. But let's let's continue on with the flow of events, the birth of Cain. Now, the birth of Cain is interesting because in Genesis 4, 1, it tells us Adam knew Eve. Adam had sex with Eve and then she conceived and then she bare Cain. And then she said, I have gotten a man from Yahweh. It does not just say Lord in a general sense. The Hebrew is very specific. It says Yahweh. So in order for us to accept the serpent seed, we have to completely disregard what Scripture says that Adam knew Eve. And again, look at the order of events. Adam knew Eve. Eve conceived. Eve bare Cain. Eve says, I have gotten a man, not a Nephilim, not a hybrid, not a giant, a man from Yahweh. This is what scripture says. So if we look at those order of events, there's no point at which the serpent seed does not cause confusion. And as I started at the top of the show, God is not the author of confusion. But let's take it a step farther with this serpent seed situation. If Eve eating the fruit represented her having sex with Satan, and then she gave the fruit to Adam. Now, according to 1 Timothy 2.14, Adam was not deceived. If Adam was not deceived, it means he intentionally entered into a homosexual act with Satan. There's no way around it. That means he knew what he was doing. So he was either by curious or created bisexual. There's no way around it. Even if it's not vocalized in the teachings, that's what you end up with. So to me, that is inconsistent with scripture unless you take the position that God created Adam as a bisexual human being. So if we stick solely to scripture, we see that in John 8, Jesus acknowledges they are indeed the sperma of Abraham. They are the ek or inwardly of Satan. And you have the same thing in first John. He says one minute. They are ek. Cain was ek or of the devil. So there's a lot of inconsistencies here. And then when you get to the flood, Zen mentioned Ham. There is no evidence at all whatsoever that Ham was a seed of Satan. Furthermore, the bloodline goes through the man, not the woman. And if you follow the genealogies through the Bible, you will find that Shemites married Hamites. So if that's the case, when Judah married a Canaanite, that means that the royal line of David also had serpent seed in it because the royal line comes down through Tamar and Judah through his son, Perez. So when you hold to the serpent seed, you get off into all these other ideas that domino effect from the original. 
I'm sorry. You actually have two minutes. You had you had two minutes. You have one more minute now. <laughs> All right, cool. So, I got another minute's worth of stuff. Cool. Sorry. All right, so you have this effect. You have Moses who marries the Cushite woman who's also from Ham. Um, you have David who marries Bathsheba whose grandfather's a Geonite and the Geonites were one of the tribes of Canaan. Bathsheba was originally married to Uriah the Hittite also from the line of Ham. And we can go on and on and on. Hagar was from Mizraim. Mizraim is Egypt from the line of Ham. And Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, one of Abraham's kids. So if you start taking the route that the serpent seed came through Ham, you also have to acknowledge that that same serpent seed is mixed into the Hebrew lines through several different sources. Um, David had Hamite women, Solomon, Abraham, Judah, uh, Joseph married a woman from Egypt, also from Ham. So you have to say that the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh also have that serpent seed in their line because Joseph's two sons were half Egyptian. And then when Jacob. All right. ad- <laughs> Sorry, that's 12 minutes uh, and with in a little bit of change because I interrupted you. And so let me reset this. And Zen, you have 12 minutes beginning now for your rebuttal. Go ahead. All right, we're going to go first to the Genesis 3 and Genesis 4, and I'm going to read some passages from the Targum because, again, these are the most ancient translations of the Hebrew Torah. They date back to the diaspora, uh, which and they came about because the Hebrew people assimilating Aramaic because of the exile um, in Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon same time that Daniel and Ezra were written, which those two books are also written in Aramaic, it shows that the Hebrew people assimilated Aramaic as a language during that time, and they came about when the temple was rebuilt, and the people were no longer able to understand Hebrew, and so the Aramaic translation was authorized. These translations, when read, studied, along with the ancient rabbinical commentaries as well, They provide clarity on what exactly happened in the garden and also how uh, Genesis 4.1 in the King James, when looked at and examined, it becomes clarified that the reason Genesis 4.1 is found at the beginning of Genesis 4, which is the chapter where Cain's lineage is separated from Genesis chapter 5, which is the line of Adam, uh, why it has placement there beginning with genesis 3 15 it says and i will put enmity between thee and the woman and between the seed of thy son and the seed of her sons thy son is a reference to cain and the seed of her sons that was abel and seth which if you look at the names for uh, cain abel and seth cain meeks acquired or possession as And we know Adam was the one that named him because he named all the animals. He named Eve. He named his sons. He acquired Cain as a stepson because he was the firstborn son of the devil. As it says, 1 John chapter 3, 12 again, Cain, who was of that wicked one, which is clarified in Matthew, which we'll go there in a second. But um, Genesis 4, 1, this is... This is key because understanding this will help you to understand what Christ is referencing, what John is referencing, what the whole Bible is referencing as the enmity between the seed lines. It says, And Adam knew Hava, his wife, who had desired the angel, semicolon, and she conceived and bare Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And she added to bear from her husband Adam, his twin, even Abel. So when they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Eve and Adam ate afterwards, Adam was just repeating the act that he has witnessed Eve and the serpent commit. And that's why it says, and she added to bear from her husband Adam, his twin, even Abel. There's no bisexuality, no homosexuality, No threesome, none of that there. It's simply referencing the serpent beguiling Eve, impregnating her with Cain, and then Adam repeating the act, which led to the birth of Abel, which is why we have these two fraternal twins 
being born, and Cain is of a different nature, different inclination from that of Adam, which is why he was the first murderer, liar, and deceiver. And again, when you understand that Adam knew Hava's wife, yes, it was him knowing her that led to the birth of Abel, who had desired the angel. It was her desiring the angel which led to her conception of Cain. And when you go to the ancient uh, Hebrew and Jewish commentaries, you get clarity on this. I'll give you two examples. One from the Legends of the Jews, published 1700 by Johann Eisenmenger. It says, And Adam knew his wife, who had conceived by the angel Samael, was pregnant and bare Cain, whose resemblance was like the upper creatures and not like the lower. And she said, I have got the man, the angel of the Lord. Now, the, these two interpretations placing the angel of the Lord in here, the reason they do so is because it was her seduction by Samael, which is just another name for Satan, that led to her saying, I have gotten a man through or from the angel of the Lord, which in my mind makes a whole lot more sense when you understand the fullness of this passage. Another from the Traditions of the Jews by Lewis Ginsburg, published 1909. Cain's descent from Satan, who is the angel Samael, was revealed in his seraphic appearance. Seraphic, that's the same thing as uh, the, you know, the feathered serpent, the Nakash, the dragon, Revelation 12, same thing. At his birth, the exclamation was wrung from Eve. I have gotten a man through an angel of the Lord. And so her de declaring at uh, Cain's birth, yes, I have gotten a man through an angel of the Lord. Wouldn't that make more sense when you understand that it was Satan, Samael, the angel of death, which impregnated her, seduced her, beguiled her, as be um, Paul says, as Christ says, as John says. So now we get even further clarity when we go to Genesis chapter 5 on this particular passage. From the Targum, it says this, And Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth. Sheth means substitute, replacement which is exactly what he was for Abel, and begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and of his similitude. For before had Hava born Cain, who was not like to him, and Abel was killed by his hand, and Cain was cast out. Neither is his seed genealized in the book of the genealogy of Adam, but afterwards there was one born like him, and he called his name Sheth. Now again, remember, Cain means acquired, um, a possession. As in, you know, you marry a woman that already has children, you acquire a stepson. He becomes your possession. Sheth means replacement, substitute, which is exactly what he was, and I'll explain why. From the Book of Jubilees, it says this, And Adam and his wife mourned for Abel four weeks of years, and in the fourth year of the fifth week, they became joyful, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bare him a son, and he called his name Seth. For he said, God hath raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. If Cain were uh, Adam and Eve's firstborn son, Seth would be their thirdborn son. But it says, Seth, God had raised up a second seed unto us on the earth instead of Abel. And so Seth is their second seed, and he was a replacement for Abel, the half-brother of Cain that was killed by him. Now, when I referenced in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, about how it was the beguilement of Eve which led to her losing her virginity and her chastity, this point is brought forth by two other stories, well, actually, several, even Tertullian speaks about this, but I'm going to just bring the two shortest passages to bring clarity to this as well. This is from Maccabees 4, which was part of the original 80-book canon, 
of the King James Bible. It says, this is Solomonia, the wife of the high priest Eleazar. She says this, the mother of seven sons expressed also these principles to her children. I was a pure virgin and did not go outside my father's house, but I guarded the rib from which woman was made. No seducer corrupted me on a desert plain, nor did the destroyer, the deceitful serpent, defile the purity of my virginity. So she is referencing the same thing that Christ alluded to, the enemy snuck into the garden, sowed the tares, same thing that Paul alluded to with Eve being beguiled, and that's the reason why she brought forth um, Cain. One other quick passage. This is from the Protovangelium of James. It says this. Now it was the sixth month with her, and behold, Joseph came from his building. He entered to his house and found her great with child, speaking of Mary. He smote his face and cast himself down upon the ground on sackcloth and wept bitterly, saying, With what countenance shall I look unto the Lord my God? What prayer shall I make concerning this maiden? For I received her out of the temple of the Lord my God, a virgin, and have not kept her safe. Who is he that hath ensnared me? Who hath done this evil in my house and hath defiled the virgin? Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. So Joseph is saying here of finding Mary pregnant when he comes home after working six months uh, in construction, that this, uh, so hath it happened to me the same as it had happened to Adam. And he's saying that the reason Mary is not a virgin any longer is because not that the serpent beguiled Mary, because we know she immaculately conceived and that it was the Holy Spirit that came upon her. But he's regarding his finding her pregnant the same as Adam finding Eve already beguiled and pregnant with Cain, which is why he says, Is not the story of Adam repeated in me? For as at the hour of his giving thanks, the serpent came and found Eve alone and deceived her, so hath it befallen me also. One minute. Um, all right, and... um. And so these ancient commentaries, the reason I study them and bring them forth is because, again, they bring clarity to why it is Cain's lineage is separated from that of Adam's in Genesis 5. And again, when you go to her eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how is it that God says to the serpent, I'm going to put enmity between you and the, uh, between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, when, again, you look up the word seed, it's zera. It means children, descendants, progeny. Now, uh, I'll, you know, as far as uh, the, the different lineages getting mixed, yes, but when you go to Luke chapter 3, the pure lineage of Christ is found in that chapter. Cain is not found in his lineage, and neither is he found in Adam's lineage. All right. And when you study this, it becomes. All right. Very good. That concludes the second segment. And uh, we're about ready to go to break. If you guys have questions, go to Facebook and look up the Revolutionary Radio Project Facebook group. And you can post your questions there. Uh, there's a lot of comments going on there. I'm not seeing any real concise questions. So help me out there if you guys want to join in on the third segment. Frequency Radio. The wicked ones obviously under heavy, heavy, heavy Masonic <laughs> influence. <laughs> Back on the 
Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the second hour of the broadcast. I'm talking with my guests, Zen Garcia and Dante Fortson. We're having a little debate here. And for this third segment, I'm going to go through questions as I see them on the Revolutionary Radio Project Facebook page. Um, I see a lot of commentary going on and it's difficult to kind of weed through it and find the questions so if you guys can help me out just give me real basic concise questions that would be awesome um but just kind of looking through what i was able to read so far um uh and i'll give each you guys three minutes to answer so uh i'll oppose it to dante first then the same question to zen were there any other breeds of humans um besides adam and eve on earth in genesis one through three and if so and they didn't sin as Adam and Eve did, were they still alive at the time of the flood nearly 1,500 years later? Go ahead, Dante. Uh, that's actually a good question. Some people believe uh, there were people, but I personally don't. If we go to Genesis chapter 5, it says Adam had other sons and daughters. Um, we can see that between Adam living 800 i'm sorry 930 years i believe it was mm -hmm. he had sons and daughters but we don't know in what order that they had them we know about cain abel and seth and we assume that cain and abel were the first two sons and then seth comes around at 130 but what happens between the death of abel and the birth of seth we don't know how many kids they might have had we don't even know if if Cain and Abel were the first two, we know that those were the first two males mentioned, but it's possible that Adam and Eve had other daughters. And the reason I come to this conclusion that they may have had daughters before Cain and Abel is that when Cain leaves Eden, he goes to Nod and he finds a wife. So it's possible that Adam and Eve had other children that were female, which is why Cain's birth in Genesis 4.1, I've received a man from the Lord. That may have been why it was such a big deal for Eve to have a male. Because you could have a bunch of females, and unless their father gets them pregnant like Lot did, there's no more mankind. But when she had the male child, it's possible that that's why she was so excited about it. But in Genesis 3.20, Adam calls his wife's name Eve, and it says because she was the mother of all living. So I have to say I do not believe that there were other humans present on the earth outside of Adam and Eve. I believe it all started with Adam and Eve and then continued on down to Noah, which is where we get the flood, and then everybody after the flood is descendant from Noah and his sons. Okay, very good. Zen, same question. Um, were there any other breeds of humans besides Adam and Eve on earth in Genesis 1 through 3? And if so, and they didn't sin as Adam and Eve did, were they still alive at the time of the flood nearly 1,500 years later? Yes, if you actually go to Genesis 1, 26, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air, over the cattle and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. These were created male and female, and it was there were multiples, not just one couple, but there were multiple couples. These are the pre-Adamites that were created on the earth and placed on the earth and told to inhabit it and multiply and replenish it. And that was a whole different creature, a whole different uh, race of beings, which is why you have in Genesis 2-7, Adam being created and then placed in paradise and when they were created when adam was created even though his body was created of the dust he was put into paradise which again is someplace different because it wasn't until they were exiled and he was cast out uh, and the cherubim put into place and the reason the cherubim would put it into place is to because they had fallen and were in a sinful nature God did not want them to eat from the tree of life and become immortal in a sinful nature. That's why he exiled them, cast them out, and placed them on the earth. And this is also why in the archaeological record, we see multiple types of pre-Adamic humans. Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, the little people, all these different beings. There were many different races of humanoids here upon the earth. 
And as far as um, Eve being called the mother of all living, that is a reference to her being the mother of both the serpent and the and Adam's line, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, because she was the mother of both lines. And Adam, he's not called the Adam of, uh, you know, the father of all living because he was only the father of one line, which, again, is why Cain's lineage is separated from that of Adam's in Genesis chapter 4. And as far as Adam and Eve having children before, no, they were bright-natured, immortal beings. I clarify this in great detail in my book. I have a chapter on the difference between paradise and the Garden of Eden, and as well as it talking about how their bodies were transformed into mortal flesh, into human physicality. And it wasn't until they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they were transformed into flesh form, which made possible Eve's beguilement by the serpent and his her impregnation with Cain. And that is why they were cast out, exiled here to the earth. And it's on the earth that they brought, that she, uh, the prophecies in Genesis 3 were fulfilled, namely that there would be enmity between the seed lines. Cain killed Abel. That was the first murder of this enmity. And Stop. All right. Um I'm just going to ask both of you to hold your comments on the other person's answers because I know if, if it was me, I'd be so tempted to jump in and give all kinds of yeah buts for what both of you guys said. So we'll save that for the final segment of the broadcast. We'll just move on to another question for now. So I hope you guys are taking notes. Um, Dante, I think, mentioned something about the punishment goes with the crime in his opening statements. And uh, that seems to me, uh, this is a question coming from me right now, that if the punishment fits the crime, why were Adam and Eve both, first of all, almost immediately focused on their genitals in the covering themselves up? And the judgment was uh, reproductive in nature as it pertains specifically to Eve. Dante, go first. Well, first of all, Adam and Eve were naked in front of people. Now, if you just look around in general, if somebody was to get their clothes ripped off in public, the first thing they do is cover up. Not because they had sex with somebody, it's because they don't want to be seen naked. Now, Adam and Eve hid. When God asked them, they specifically said, we hid because we were naked. We didn't hide because we had sex with the serpent or anything like that. They specifically said we were naked and we were afraid. So that's the direct answer straight from scripture. Now, I can't speak on any of the commentary that was read outside of scripture. I can only go by what the Bible says. They said they were naked and they were afraid. We know the serpent was there and God was coming. So you have two people whose eyes were just open to the fact that they have no clothes on and they have an audience. They have the enemy of mankind and God, and they have God. The Arguably, the most powerful, God being the most powerful being in the universe, and sa Satan being somewhere up there in the hierarchy. They're standing in front of them naked. So, to me, it's it didn't necessarily say anything about their genitals or the act that it just happened. They were just ashamed to be naked in front of other beings. And that's natural because we see that in our day and age, whether sex is involved or not. OK, you still got another minute and a half if you want to take it. <laughs> uh, pertaining to. This, I always say stick to scripture if what you're reading outside of scripture does not line up with what's in scripture toss out the extra so we can only go by the words that they gave god or the answer that they gave god when he asked and my other question to everybody how did they learn how to sew the first thing they did was sew. If this was a purely sexual act, where did they learn sewing skills from? How did they know if they grabbed leaves and sewed them together, they'd be sufficient clothing? So these are questions you have to ask yourself. These are little um, small pieces that you have to look into. It's not always the big stuff. It's the small stuff that may shed light on the bigger issue. Okay, very good. And... 
Zen. Um, punishment fits the crime uh, is sort of the idea here. So what's your take on the fact that you know, wh- after they did what they did, the first thing they do is covering up their genitals and then the judgment is reproductive in nature? Well, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, from the King James, it says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And so they were naked and had no problem with being naked. But it wasn't until they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that all of a sudden they want to sow these fig leaves and cover their genitals. Again, if it was just them eating, eating a f- apple or a pomegranate or a fruit, why cover your genitals? The reason they cover their genitals is because, again, you look up the word for beguiled. It means wholly seduced. And then the punishment that was levied against them, the reason it is reproductive as nature is because the serpent beguiled her, impregnated her with Cain. God, the Lord God was telling them in prophecy that in Genesis 3, 15, 16, and 17, what was going to happen as a repercussion of them consequentially having eaten this fruit and being beguiled by the serpent. And then Adam eating also and repeating the act with Eve. They would bring forth children. Eve would bring forth children in sorrowful conception. The serpent would have his own seed And there would be enmity placed between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. That's the beginning of the enmity. That's a prophecy of the birth of Cain and Abel. And the enmity is Cain murdering his half-brother. That's the beginning of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And then Adam having to work the ground in order to bring forth sustenance to feed his children, that's also a consequent of them, it be, her being beguiled and him repeating the act with her and bringing forth Abel, his own son, and also taking Cain as a possession, uh, acquiring him as a stepson. That's why we see the consequences in Genesis 3 connected to reproduction. And again, they were naked before in Genesis chapter 2 and were not ashamed. So while all of a sudden they become ashamed after eating this fruit. It's because they used their genitals in the act which brought on their shame. And that's why they were hiding themselves. And that's why the consequences are levied in connection to their genitals. Okay. Um, We see in the first prophecy in the Bible that Eve's seed, the, the Eve's seed will crush the devil's head. But we also see, I mean, this is the title of this uh, debate, and we've talked about it a few times during the broadcast, that there's this enmity between your seed and her seed. So, Dante, if we are to take it literally, most people accept that when it says her seed, it's ultimately talking about Yeshua. And Yeshua has a line of human beings that are, are can be readily traced back all the way back ultimately to Adam and Eve. And so if we're able to accept the the ancestry of Yeshua and that her seed represents Yeshua, who or what are we talking about when it said when he says that your seed, and he's referring to the serpent, is gonna have enmity with her seed? What's going all on? Right, there? All right. As you pointed out, most people accept that Christ was the prophesied seed of the woman. Now that seed did not come immediately. And that is at complete opposition with Zen's interpretation that the seed of the woman was able. Also, Satan was not punished for so-called sleeping with Eve like the fallen angels were in Genesis 6. They were punished and cast to Tartarus bound in chains of darkness. Satan doesn't go that un- undergo that punishment, which gives us an indication that that is not what happened in the garden. Satan is punished later after the arrival of the Antichrist. Now, we know that's not his name in the Bible, but for the sake of you know general terminology, the Antichrist is who many people believe will be the son of Satan, which may explain why he's bound for a thousand years, because he has to go undergo that punishment that the other angels went through. And there's also another problem if you want to interpret Cain and Abel as the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
the seed of the woman was supposed to kill the seed of the serpent. That's not what happens in Genesis. Cain, who is supposedly the seed of the serpent, kills the seed of the woman. That is completely backwards from what is taught. There's also a lot of backwards stuff that goes on in there. Cain is never referred to as a Nephilim, and we know that that's what they are. We know that God placed a mark on Cain so that nobody would kill Cain. The only other people God has a mark placed on so that nobody kills them is found in Ezekiel 9, when he tells the people to go slaughter every man, woman, and child, except for those who have the mark. And in Genesis 7, where everybody is marked before the locusts come, that's the only time that God marks anybody. God does not mark Nephilim to be saved. It just doesn't work that way. So the seed of the serpent is, in my opinion, still yet to come through the Antichrist. And it did not arrive through Cain because the prophecy does not fit. The seed of the woman has to defeat the seed of the serpent. And that's not what happened in the Cain and the Abel story. Okay. And uh, Zen, same question. And when it's talking about, you know, her seed and his seed, what do we talk about? Most people think that the seed of the woman is ultimately Yeshua and that he has an ancestry of humans that can be traced from Adam and Eve all the way to him. And yet they want to kind of ignore that when it's dealing with uh, the seed of the serpent. What's your take on that? Well, I wrote a whole chapter called Crushing the Head of the Serpent in my new book on the Great Contest. Uh, this was a prophecy about the coming of Christ and his being crucified um, in Calgary, on in Golgotha, which if you look up Golgotha, it means Goliath the Gath. And the reason it, it is called Goliath the Gath is because when David stunned Goliath and ran up to him, cut his own head off with his sword. He took Goliath's head back to Jerusalem to show to the people that he had, in fact, slaughtered the Philistine champion that had been mocking God the, for several days until uh, David dispatched him. And then afterward, he placed, he buried Goliath's head there at the place called Calvary, the Hill of the Skull, Golgotha, meaning Goliath of Gath. And so when, cruci when Christ was crucified there thousands of years later, he actually fulfilled that prophecy in Genesis 3.15 because he was being crucified. He was crushing the head of the serpent. Goliath was the seed of the serpent that had his head being crushed because his skull was buried in the ground there at the same place and he was nipping at the heel of Yeshua. I go into great detail in this. Go to chapter 16, I believe it is, in my book, um, Crushing the Head of the Serpent. And this is also why you will find in Luke chapter 3, which is where the genealogy of Christ is mentioned, where Cain is not found in it. It says in verse 37, which was the son of Methuselah, which was the son of Enoch, which was the son of Jared, which was the son of Malalil, which was the son of Canaan which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of God. And this is why Christ was the fulfillment. He was the seed of the woman that crushed the head of the serpent because he was not of Cain's line. And he, in fact, did fulfill that prophecy. Now, you can find two other genealogical records in the Cave of Treasures and also in the Book of the Bee, which also exclude... Uh, came from the genealogy. I'll read one more example. From Adam to Seth, from Seth to Enos, from Enos to Canaan, from Canaan to Mahalil, to Mahal, from Mahalil to Yared, from Yared to Enoch, from Enoch to Methuselah, from Methuselah to Lamech, from Lamech to Noah. That's from the Cave of Treasures. And again, there's another genealogical record in the Book of the Bee, which also excludes Cain and shows that Christ, yes, was the fulfillment as the seed of the woman and again, when he was crucified on the cross, he fulfilled that prophecy. That shows to you in Genesis, in three, uh, chapter 3, verse 15, the okay. oldest prophecy uh, is connected to Christ. Okay. Um, how is Enoch seventh from Adam in Jude 14 if Cain is the first from Adam? He would be eighth. Dante? All right, this is one of those things— 
I, I believe Zen keeps bringing up a red herring. It has nothing to do with anything as far as the genealogies are concerned. Cain has no reason to appear in the genealogy of Christ because nobody from Cain led to Christ. Japheth doesn't appear. Ham doesn't appear. Esau doesn't appear. Ishmael doesn't appear. Eleven of the people of the 12 tribes don't appear in Christ's genealogy. So that's a red herring. So when you when you look at this seventh from Adam, it starts counting from the lineage that Christ would come through. So you start at Adam and then you go to Seth and then you count down to Enoch and Enoch is seventh. There is no reason for Cain to appear in a Sethite genealogy because Cain was not a son of Seth. Adam starts off Genesis 4.1. That's what my Bible says. I don't know what other Bibles anybody else reading. My Bible in Genesis 4.1 starts off with Adam having sex with Eve, and they have Cain, and then you get Cain's descendants. When you get to Seth, you have Seth's descendants. Same thing when you get to Abraham. Ishmael does not appear in Isaac's genealogy and vice versa. There's no reason to mix the people into each other's genealogies. Same thing with Noah, with Sham, Ham, and Japheth. They don't appear in each other's genealogies either. So when you follow these genealogies, you have to go through the chosen son. Cain is not the chosen son. Seth is. So you start from Adam and you go to Seth. You wouldn't go Adam, Cain, Seth, because that's not the genealogy. The genealogy through which Christ came is Adam, Seth, Enos, and so on. So keep that in mind whenever you hear this red herring argument about Cain not appearing in Genesis 5. That's Seth's genealogy, and there's no reason for that to happen. Otherwise, we have to use the same interpretation across the Bible and say that Ishmael was not Abraham's son because he didn't appear in Isaac's genealogy, or the 11 sons were not um, Jacob's sons because they didn't appear in Judah's genealogy. It's consistent all through the Bible. Everybody has their own genealogy, so you count from that specific genealogy, which is the genealogy of Seth. Okay, very good. And Zen, your answer. Um, it says in Jude 14 that Enoch is seventh from Adam. And if we're counting from the first from Adam, he would be eighth. What's your take on that? Again, the reason uh, in, in the Cain was cast out, neither is his seed genealogized in the book of the genealogy of Adam. But afterwards, there was one born like him, and he called his name Seth which is why Seth is included in Genesis chapter 5, because he is the one through the Adam's line is born through because Abel was murdered by his half-brother. And again, this is also why if you include um, Cain in that account, again, it would, bring, um, it would bring Enoch to be the eighth. But just as it, Enoch, I mean, Cain is excluded from the lineage of Christ in Genesis chapter 3, so is he excluded from that particular account. And uh, w as far as Ishmael and Esau and these other, they are considered the seed of perdition. Yes, they are born um, the same father, Abraham. And then with regard to uh, Jacob, they had the same mother, Rachel. Uh, but still, Adam and um, as uh, Abraham's child, Isaac, and also Jacob, they are counted as the seed of promise. Ishmael and Esau are counted as the seed of perdition, which is why you have these bloodline wars in, occurring between them all throughout Scripture. Um, and it, this is the same thing. It's the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. The reason all of the patriarchs all throughout the scriptures kept detailed genealogical records is because there were two bloodline lineages that were separate from one another, which is why Israel is told often never to take wives from the pagan, pagan tribes or the Gentiles. They were to remain pure and to keep. And the reason being, again, is because Christ was to be born of, this, of the pure line of Adam through Seth, and that's why he was the fulfillment of the Genesis 3, the prophecy of the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. 
It's all connected to bloodline war. Even the the harvest at the end of days, the gathering of the tares for um, for for punishment and the wheat for preservation. It has to do with bloodline and lineage. Yes, it is also has to do with spirituality because when Christ died on the cross, he extended grace and chance for salvation unto even the Canaanite tribes, even those people that are born of the seed of perdition. And that's why, um, you know, they can also, uh, these people coming out of these Illuminati bloodlines, <clears throat> they know they are from Cain. Uh, but they know that they can be redeemed to, through Christ as well. All right, and that's three minutes right there, and we're about ready to go to break. And then we come back, you both will get uh, 12 minutes for your final uh, remarks. Back on the Revolutionary Radio Project. I am your host, Rob Skiba, for the final half hour segment of the broadcast. We're having a little debate here uh, about the serpent seed doctrine, and my guests are Dante Fortson and Zen Garcia. Boy, that last segment went by way too fast. I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, there are plenty more there. Um, I, I just I want to encourage you guys to continue to interact. Please feel free to do so on the Revolutionary Radio Project Facebook group after the show. I'd also encourage both my guests to continue to share their views and additional resources with their audience there uh, after the show as well. So we'll go into this final segment. Dante, you have 12 minutes to uh, give your final statements and any other rebuttals you'd like to give. All right. Well, first off, let me point out that I'm only using the Bible. I'm not using any extra text, any outside commentaries. I'm not accepting any of it as fact unless I can verify it in the Bible first. And then if I can verify it in the Bible first, I will use text to back up what I have to say. And I don't think it's really necessary to use any outside text with this. One of the reasons I've pointed out, John 8 was clearly misinterpreted. There's a reason that people who teach serpent seed skip right over John 8, 37, and that's because a different word is used. The word sperm is used, and they want to use John 8, 44 to try to prove their position. Ye are of your father, the devil. And as I pointed out earlier, it's two different words. Sperma is found in John 8, 37, Strong's 46, 90 which backs up my point. Jesus acknowledges that they are Abraham's sperma. And then he says, you are ek or of the devil, suggesting from the inside outward their motives, which were trying to kill him. Uh, Paul uses the same word ek when he says Cain was of the wicked one. The same word ek is used. It's not a different word. He, Cain is never called the sperma of Satan unless you go outside of the Bible. Now, if you go back and listen to this later, Zen clearly said that the seed of the woman would have enmity with the seed of the serpent, and that represented Cain and Abel. And then he went back and said that, yes, it represents Christ. It does not represent both. Those are two different prophecies, two different events that happened. Um, I believe the whole Cain is not in Adam's genealogy is a red herring. There is no reason for Cain to appear in Genesis chapter 5 because his genealogy is covered in Genesis chapter 4, and it starts with Adam. I also encourage everybody to look at the order of events according to the Bible. 
not any outside commentary, but the word of God that you can read. Now, I can't speak for Zen or anybody else, but I don't put outside commentary on the same level as the Bible. My Bible tells me that Satan deceived Eve with his words, which Paul alludes to. He talks about the corruption of the mind, not the body. Satan deceives Eve with his words. Eve then eats the fruit and then she gives it to Adam and their eyes are opened. They feel ashamed. The same reason kids feel ashamed. Kids will run around naked all day. They will not have a problem with it until they are told by an adult that they need to cover up or until their eyes are open. There does not have to be any sexual contact with a child or anything else to make a child feel ashamed of being naked. They only have, need to have the knowledge of being naked to become ashamed. And I think the whole serpent seed theory, again, collapses in on itself because of all the red herrings. To say that Cain does not appear in the genealogy of Christ makes no sense. If you were to have twins right now and one of those twins gave birth to a mega superstar later in life, there would be no reason for your other twin to appear in that mega superstar's genealogy. They are two different kids with two different bloodlines, and this is consistent. And we see this consistency starting in Genesis with Cain and Abel. Cain's genealogy happens in Genesis 4. Seth's genealogy happens in Genesis 5. When we get to Genesis 10, we see separate genealogies for Shem, Ham, Ham, and Japheth. When we get to Isaac, we see separate genealogies for him and Ishmael. We see separate genealogies for Jacob and Esau. We see separate genealogies for all 12 of the kids. So to say this saint, that Cain does not appear in Christ's genealogy is again a red herring. And you can go through the entire Bible and pick this stuff apart. And I encourage you to grab a Strong's Concordance and actually check the references for yourself. Don't just believe them because you are told to believe it or you are told that Paul is referencing being Cain's genetic son when he says Cain is of the devil because that's simply not what the Hebrew says. Again, the word ek, um, the word sperma, two different words, two different connotations, and one is spiritual, one is physical. One is internal, and one has to do with DNA. You look at what happened. Eve ate from the tree, which Eve, which Zen has still not explained why Eve ate from the tree and how that becomes interpreted as she had sex with Satan, who was the serpent. There is no physical interaction listed in the Bible between Eve and the serpent. There's only a conversation mentioned in the Bible, nothing else. Adam was not deceived. Adam knew exactly what was going on. So regardless of how you want to take the he ate the fruit or whatever he did, Adam knew exactly what was going on. There's no way around it. Furthermore, I don't believe that there were pre-Adamite humans that had anything to do with Adam and Eve in the garden. God told them to be fruitful and multiply. He gave them a command to have sex. So there is no reason for them to be ashamed of sex. Now, if you want to take the interpretation that the trees were something other than trees, which Zen has already clarified that he believes they were literal trees, but some people who teach serpency teach that these were other beings and not um, trees. So if you want to take that, you have to ask yourself, what did God really plant in the garden when it says he planted trees? If you don't want to accept the interpretation as food, you have to ask, why does it say that they were good for food? And in my opinion, what the serpent seed teaching does is exactly what the serpent did to Eve in the garden. We have Genesis 4, 1 that is clear. Adam knew Eve. Eve conceived. Eve bare Cain. Eve says, I got a man. Again, not a Nephilim, not a giant, not a hybrid from Yahweh. 
it says Yahweh in the Strong's. It does not say Samael. It does not say Satan. It doesn't say the angel of the Lord. It says none of that in Scripture. But serpent seed comes along and says, Yea, did God say that Cain was the son of Adam? And if you say, yeah, it's clear. Cain is the son of Adam based on this verse. Serpent seed comes back along and says, well, no, try this knowledge right here. It can't hurt. It's just knowledge. It's the same exact conversation. Now, I can't speak for any anybody else. I stick to scripture first. And if the outside text support scripture, I keep it. If the outside texts do not support what I can clearly see in scripture, I do not accept that outside text as gospel. I know it's there. It may be interesting, but I don't accept it as gospel. So that's really all I have to say on the subject. To me, the serpent seed can be entirely disproven with a King James Bible and a Strong's Concordance with no need for any outside text. Okay, uh, we got uh, about two, two and a half minutes to spare if you want to take them. If not, we'll have some extra dialogue at the end. Yeah, um, if anybody wants to grab the show notes later on, I'll have everything posted on my website on ministerfortson.com. And I'll have everything um, linked so you can click to the Strong's Concordance and see the difference between the words ek and sperma. I'll do that as soon as it's finished. Um, after Rob gets back with me uh, with the link to the MP3 and some of the other stuff, I'll have the replay posted. I know Rob's going to post it. I don't know about Zen, um, but I know for sure that me and Rob will have the replay uh, posted on the page. So if you want to go back, look, listen to it, look through the notes as we talk, check the references for yourself. All my Bible verses are listed and on the website. So go to ministerfortson.com and re-listen to this, check the notes, see for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. You can use the free Strong's Concordance on BibleHub.com, click interlinear. Uh, you can click parallel and see some of the other translations, not commentary or interpretation. They have that on there too. But if you click um, interlinear, it shows you the Hebrew and the Greek. And if you click parallel, it shows you other versions of the Bible so you can read right along with it. And if you can't find it in the Bible or if it's not backed by the Bible, toss it out. All right. Very good. Thank you, Dante. And let me reset the clock here. And Zen, you have 12 minutes for your final uh, statements and any rebuttal you'd like to give. Go ahead. Well, I know myself, I study the ancient texts and the ancient commentaries and other biblical books in order to get a better understanding of the Bible. And so that's what I would assume most other people do when they study this other big extra biblical material. And when you do so, it again, it's not contradicting the Bible as far as the serpent seed. It's actually clarifying the Bible. And to bring this point home, I'll simply go to the words of Christ himself, because all one needs to do is study Matthew chapter 13, the parables that are written therein, to understand that he is alluding exactly to Genesis chapter 3, and that the beguilement of Eve, in fact, had sexual connotations associated to it, which is why it's not an apple. If it were an apple, as Dante is trying to get you to believe, how does it lead to seed and the serpent having seed, and the woman having seed, and then there's enmity between both. Let's clarify. Let's go to Christ. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat, and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, meaning brought forth children, fruit, again, in Hebrew means progeny, children, semen, virile, um, and descendants, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? When, from whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. That enemy is Satan. Uh, this, and he'll clarify this in the parable of the tares of the field. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. Lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, 
I will say to the reapers, gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, the reason Satan wasn't immediately dispatched is just same with the way Cain was given a mark of protection. They were given reprieve for a certain amount of time. For Satan, it would be 7,000 years, 120 jubilees and one millennial reign. For uh, Cain, it was seven generations un- and so that the tares could come up with the wheat, as it says in this parable. And the reason he was given reprieve for seven generations is so that the generations of Cain, the wheat and the tares would come up together. And he wasn't uh, given protection forever. He was killed by Lamech of his own line. So he was only like Satan, given reprieve. As far as the uh, the the Genesis 6 Nephilim, that was a whole different thing. They left their place of habitation. Christ told them not to involve themselves in fornication, and they immediately did it, which is why he brought down his wrath upon them. We covered this in great detail on the show previously. Let's continue. Then Jesus sent the multitude away. So here, the apostles are going to ask him to explain the tares of the field. So he's no longer speaking in parables. Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said unto him, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and buried in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And so he is explaining directly to the apostle that the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The enemy there is the reference to the kingdom of the, the parable of the kingdom that I just read from. And also the reference to the, uh, the wicked one, again, First John chapter 3, verse 12, Christ is alluding to the same thing that John tells you. Cain is of that wicked one. Of means child of. Look it up in your strongs. And when you look up all these terms here, sowed, um, fruit, uh, all of that has reproductive sexual connotations, just like the punishments in Genesis chapter 3. And just to clarify once more, Christ again goes into this. He In verse 47, chapter 13, he says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore, sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have ye understood all these things? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. So they knew then that this is exactly what Christ was referencing. Now, we'll go to Matthew chapter 23, where he says, That upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel, unto the blood of Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. Uh, He is referencing them as being this bloodline, these the, the, the Pharisees as being the killer of the prophets from Abel to Zacharias. Who killed Abel? Cain. So they must be connected to Cain, and that's exactly what he's referencing here. And remember, Cain had a seraphic, appearance, which is why he calls them ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Now, I'm going to try to read this. I don't know if I have time, but um, this also explains what the what the elites think of themselves. You have five minutes. Okay, I believe I'll be able to finish that. 
His benefactor test subject believed that while most of the sons of Adam had double-strand DNA, he had been told by his family that he and his blood relatives were distinctly different and that he, like his fathers before him, had triple-strand DNA. He wanted my friend to secretly prove once and for all if this was true or not. The subject claimed that his extended family and their cousins, who are kings, queens, princesses, and princesses, leaders of industry and banking worldwide, believe they are children of an otherworldly race of humanoid beings. He'd been taught by his tutors that once upon a time, his ancestors had fallen to earth after some cosmic calamity in the time before the garden. He believed that while their ancestral mother was Eve, their ancestral father was not Adam. He was torn to know if a child of Cain was actually genetically different from um, different and whether he could be saved. He thought of the Vatican's pronouncement that the aliens are our cousins and the Vishnu teachings of a time when gods flew in spaceships and destroyed whole cities in a single blast. He even had notes about Elijah being caught up in a chariot of fire. Maybe he had misread or misunderstood the entire history of his Bible. Maybe from Genesis to Revelations, it was about some far more tangible and real fallen angel alien cousins than the ghost-like destroying angels he'd always pictured in his imagination. It only matters what they believe because our original subject and his relatives believe that they are the children of an otherworldly race of humanoid beings, but not human only, hybrid human, more than human, superior alien humans. Our subject and his kin have been taught by their families and tutors that once upon a time, their ancestors had fallen to the earth after this cosmic war and that their ancestral mother was Eve, their ancestral father, not Adam. They believe they are our human cousins, superior hybrids, half alien, only half human. They once reigned from Olympus and were pharaohs. Whatever the real truth of their history, their belief is the driver of their actions. Being the true believers they are, they will continue to operate in accordance with their belief and the laws of alien Darwinian type survival. That's why they interbreed to maintain the purity of their bloodline. That's why they secretly meet and connive to pass power between themselves. And that's why they must fool the rest of mankind into wars of self-destruction and debt so that we may be forever enslaved to their lust on this prison planet. It had begun, just as my friend had said, as a murder investigation, starting with the first murderer when that Luciferian demon dad had first whispered of his evil deed to his willing child, Cain. It continued down through the line, the sons of Adam fighting for survival and destroying the alien giants in Canaan, David and the hybrid Goliath and his four hybrid brothers, and all the hidden truth believers that since, hiding in plain sight, so powerful, so important, so, so afraid. These earthbound half-cousins of ours continue to laugh, but it is a nervous laugh at that, as they have a joke or two at our expense, recreating their lying father's fall to earth and flashing their heretofore secret gang hand signs to each other right in our faces. I know now how dangerous their beliefs are because they are being driven by their beliefs, taught to them by their real alleged father, the father of lies. And even now he knows the truth and whispers in his initiate's ear, just as he first did in Cain's ear, the sons of Adam, as long as they live, are dangerous. This is a, a, a passage that was um, the, a story on Steve Coyle's website of this guy named Danny Moreno, who was a, a scientist, a geneticist that in, inherited this whole investigation when his friend, who was a world-renowned geneticist, was killed after being hired by one of these elites to do this investigation, to this genetic study to see if the sons of Cain, the elites, had triple-strand DNA or double-strand DNA as the sons of Adam had. And so the elites themselves believe they are from the sons of Cain and that they are genetically different. And, and they are, because again, Cain was a hybrid, which is why they are mentioned in scriptures as the seed of the serpent and why seconds. Christ and why Christ calls them um, the den of vipers, the tares who are born of the wicked one, the children of the devil, the enemy which snuck into the garden and sowed the tares. Wow. All right. And that wraps up pretty much the debate. Um, we only got 
three minutes left of the broadcast. Dante, uh, share with our audience your contact information if anybody wants to contact you and any books or blogs or anything you have related to this topic that people can check out. All right, so ministerfortson.com. If anybody wants to check out the show notes, they are up there right now. Also, I have an article on Cain being the serpent seed. Um, the, I guess you say the sticking points for me. There is that article, the notes, and the notes on the site are only about six or seven pages long. I also have a book called The Serpent Seed Debunked. It's available on Amazon.com. It has over 50 pages of notes, bullet pointed, pointing out everything wrong with serpent seed in every single part that contradicts the Bible or adds confusion to the Bible. Every single part that cannot be backed up with scripture and has to be backed up with outside commentary. So, again, ministerfortson.com if you want to get in contact with me or read any of the stuff I've written uh, against Serpent Seed. Okay, excellent. And Zen, you got about a minute and a half. Where can people contact you and what resources do you have for people to check out uh, on the other side of this argument? Zen Garcia on Facebook, Zen Garcia 2010 at gmail.com. I've written three books on this subject Lucifer, Father of Cain, which is 340 some pages. My newest two books, The Great Contest, both of those are near, well, one of them is 400 pages. The other one is 460 pages. And so there's an extensive amount of information from many sources. But again, you don't have to go outside of the King James, once you understand what is really going on within the scriptures, to make sense of this, even just from Christ's words, as I read. And as Dante said, when you study the extra stuff and it adds to your understanding of scripture, don't throw it out, but include it. If it indeed does contradict scripture, but maybe it just your interpretation of scripture well, then maybe open your mind to something new, new possibility. Study it out for yourself. Read both my book and his book. You know, for, again, 460-plus pages, the new book that I just released, The Great Contest, The Enmity Between the Seed Lines. And right. also, I re, you know, I released a special for Revolutionary Radio's um, listeners. You can find it on the show description. Awesome. Hey, I want to thank both you gentlemen for a passionate but civil debate. I really enjoyed it. Thank you guys for joining us this evening. And thank you guys so much for listening to the Revolutionary Radio Project. We'll see you back next week, 11 p.m. Central Standard Time. Good night, everybody. Shalom. God bless all. so much for watching i hope you enjoyed this video presentation if you did please subscribe to my youtube channel like the video and share it on your favorite social media sites there's a lot more to come so stay tuned and we'll see you back next time